Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, The Pyramid of Success for Kubernetes, brought to you by Fairwinds. We have a great webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for on-demand viewing. We will be sending out a link to access the webinar on demand, or you can visit DevOps.com slash webinar or ContainerJournal.com slash webinars. Uh, we we want to hear from you, so please feel free to send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A tab. We also encourage dis, uh, discussion by using the chat tab. So let us know your thoughts or just say a quick hello. We have uh, a couple of polling question to, uh, questions today during today's event, so we'd appreciate if you could take a couple of seconds to submit your answers when you see those come up on your screen. Finally, stick around until the end because we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So stay tuned to see if you're a winner. Uh, and finally, joining me today is Robert Brennan, Director of Open Source Software, Fairwinds, Andy Sutterman, Director of R&D and Technologies, uh, Fairwinds, and Stevie Caldwell, Tech Lead, Fairwinds. Uh, and with that, I'm going to put myself on mute, turn off my camera, and hand it over to Stevie. Thank you. Uh, hey, y'all. So welcome to today's uh, webinar, The Pyramid of Success for Kubernetes. Um, as you've heard, we are from Fairwinds, uh, and Fairwinds is, uh, we are Kubernetes governance and security experts. And so we're here to share a little bit, a uh, little bit of our expertise with you today. Um, my name is Stevie Caldwell. I'm a senior SRE and tech lead at Fairwinds. And joining me today are my colleagues, Robert Brennan and Andy Suderman, and I'll let them introduce themselves, Robert. Hey folks, I'm Robert Brennan. Uh, I'm director of open source software here at Fairwinds. Uh, I've been working in software for uh, a little over a decade now, working in open source for about six years, and I've been working with Kubernetes for about three. Uh, really excited to talk to you all today about the pyramid of success. All right, and uh, I'm Andy, director of R&D and technology. I've been doing things with infrastructure since I was a kid. Been working in this industry for a while now, and uh, I've been doing Kubernetes for, I think, about five years now. So super excited to talk all things Kubernetes. So uh, as this slide shows you, uh, Kubernetes is the hotness, right? Um, lots of organizations, uh, you know, if they're talking about running their applications uh, as containers, Kubernetes is uh, part of the conversation. 87% um, of orgs are now managing uh, their workloads this way. Uh, there's been an increase um, in Kubernetes adoption uh, due to the digital first nature of the pandemic. And uh, that Kubernetes adoption has uh, shown to help companies uh, do things like accelerate their deployment frequency, uh, increase their automation and decrease their IT costs. So, um, you know, it makes, it's, it makes sense and uh, is obvious why folks are, are looking in that direction. Uh, so this uh, slide actually dovetails into our first uh, polling question, um, which Julio will read off for you. Uh, yes, you, you should see a polling question uh, on your screen. And um, the polling question is, where are you in your Kubernetes journey? Uh, first option, uh, I'm learning about containers in Kubernetes, followed by planning to use in six to 12 months. Then we have using only in testing slash development environment, and I am using it in production. So we'll give the attendees a couple of seconds here to fill out their polls. And so far it seems pretty evenly split. I'm never, I'm never sure, sure if I'm, I'm supposed, supposed to answer. To answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Still getting responses here. <clears throat> wow. And uh, as of right now, uh, it is OK. It was at 25% for every. <laughs> but so far, uh, A, I'm, I'm learning about containers and Kubernetes seems to be the highest at 28, still getting some responses. 23% uh, have responded planning to use in six to 12 months. 23% uh, responded using only in testing development. 
environment. Okay, and now I'm using it in production, has a lead with 30%. Hmm. So, so thank you for uh, participating in that. Looks, all right, excellent. That was cool. It was like being at the races and uh, the races and hearing people like talking about the horses. <laughs> All right. So uh, some of you may be familiar with this graphic. Uh, if you're Ted Lasso fans, uh, this is apparently a thing that they put on their wall, like in the first episode. I've watched it and I don't remember this at all, but uh, <laughs> this is a thing. And so uh, John Wooden's a real person. Um, he was a UCLA uh, coach. And apparently over uh, a number of years, he uh, started making a list of characteristics and traits that made uh, a successful person. And then he pared those down to 25 and built this really clear to read <laughs> a pyramid um, that people use for reference. Uh, so we decided to riff off of that, right? And and do something similar with Kubernetes, uh, which is why we have our, next slide, please. Kubernetes, Pyramid of Kubernetes success, right? Um, so uh, for users of Kubernetes, the three basic elements uh, for success are efficiency, security, and reliability. And so what we're gonna do today um, is Robert and Andy are gonna break down the importance of each element in the pyramid and how each builds on another to create highly functional and ultimately successful Kubernetes ownership. So we start at the base of the pyramid uh, and you know the very first thing we have here is good containerization practices, right? Because your containers are um, really the the cornerstone of of uh, of your success. Um, you know there are things that you can do with your containers that help make sure that you will actually reap the benefits of running on um, an orchestration platform like Kubernetes. So um, Andy, you want to talk about what some of those practices are? Yeah, definitely. I'm glad our graphics a lot easier to read than the uh, the one above <laughs> it. Uh, I yeah. struggle with that. It's just too many things on it. We're gonna stick to. Uh, just five here today. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the thing, you know, there's quite a few things to keep in mind when you're when you're building your containers. Um, you know, and there's some really straightforward, low hanging fruit um, that we can start with on the security side. Don't build can uh, don't build uh, secrets directly into your containers, right? Uh, those should be and injected into your container at runtime via you know an environment variable or a volume mount in the cluster. Don't bake those into the container. Um, that's a fairly straightforward one that I think is uh, easy to get done early on. Um, and in addition to that, from a reliability standpoint, later on, this will become important, but not baking config into your containers. So it should be really an immutable object. Think of it kind of like an artifact if you're thinking of older build processes where you're building you know, a binary and shipping it and then running it your container is just an extension of that process, right? It contains the dependencies, but uh, it really shouldn't contain your config or your secrets. Those need to be injected into the container at runtime with other Kubernetes constructs that we can talk about. Yeah, I total, totally agree there. I think um, uh, from the efficiency perspective too, um, I think there's a lot that um, you can do to really pare down the size of the container and make sure that it's, it's as simple and lightweight as possible. And that actually also plays into security. You know, the less you have in terms of like the, the overhead of, you know, the underlying operating system, you know, extra binaries that are installed, uh, the less tools an attacker has if they get access to that container to actually exploit it and maybe, you know, uh, get inside your binary, affect its behavior, things like that. So using a, a stripped down uh, operating system like Alpine instead of like Ubuntu or, you know, one of the bigger Linux operating systems is a really good practice if you're, if you're really a pro you might build from scratch in which case there's just like nothing in there for an attacker to use not even like a shell for them to connect to um, so really trying to pare down those images as much as possible will help you have small images from an efficiency perspective it makes those images really fast to download and then from a security perspective it makes it really hard for an attacker to do anything yeah that's a really good point using that multi-stage build process and then you know like in the example of all of our go projects we use a multi-stage build process we build and then the container in some cases we do build from scratch and we just put that built binary straight into the scratch container and that's all that's in there so the attack surface is really small um i just had another one that flew out of my head while we were talking um 
Well, you, you touched on earlier, Andy, this idea of um, uh, being being stateless, you know, injecting your configuration, injecting your secrets. And, and another thing I wanted to touch on um, in terms of reliability is just making sure that um, your containers are really truly stateless. Uh, if you're doing anything like storing state in memory or on disk, that can really get in the way of scaling those containers, right? You want to be able to have multiple instances of the same container, say, you know, doing the same job, serving the same traffic um, without needing to like share memory or share state between them. Um, so pulling out that that state into something like, a, you know, a database or something that can live outside of the container, I think is a really important part of the containerization process. True. That's a, that's a good point, because we've definitely seen instances where people were running one replica uh, in their cluster because they weren't. It wasn't. Cap they weren't capable of running multiples, and they had to go back and refactor some things to, uh, to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At this point, really, we're talking not just about containerization specifically, but about application development. Right. We need to have an application that can scale horizontally, and then adding on to that, um, another key that's going to be really important later uh, in the, this conversation is uh, having some sort of health checking endpoint, right? A status endpoint that indicates this application is healthy. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's responding. That can be as simple as, you know, a 200 response on a specific API endpoint. And it can be as complicated as, you know, that response actually checking functionality of the application and returning, you know, a, a, uh, an, a code indicative of that state. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I guess just to, to sum up on the containerization stuff, uh, I think the, the big takeaway is that it's not as simple as just wrapping your application, your existing application in a Docker file. You're probably right. going to need to re-architect your app, um, you know, in order to, to make it work well with containers. Yeah, for sure. And then the last one I'll add that I just remembered from earlier that flipped out of my head on the security standpoint, being able to run not as root inside of your container. Yeah. So uh, that's also going to be important when we go to run in Kubernetes from a security standpoint. But if your application has to run as root, you're not going to be able to deploy it uh, in a way that doesn't run as root. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. Cool. All right, so uh, the next topic or the next layer of our pyramid uh, is about building and pushing containers. So we've like done all these great container practices. We've got it running not as a root user, as a non-root user. We don't have any uh, you know, state uh, stored in there so we can run multiple replicas. Now we need to uh, build our uh, container and push it somewhere. Robert. Yeah, um, so I think uh, the the first thing I would recommend is building and pushing your containers on on really every commit or every branch that goes into your repository. Um, so having like a CI/CD process set up that's going to build the container, make sure it builds properly without you know uh, failing to compile or something like that, um, and then storing storing those Docker images so that you know a developer uh, can can uh, deploy a um, uh, you know, like a QA branch for their application. So you can have like kind of a testing environment, um, you know, having a, a record um, of kind of every, for every commit in the repo, knowing, okay, what did, what did the application look like at that point in time? Um, I think tagging with the, with the commit hash is a really good idea um, just so that you can easily track, you know, okay, this, this uh, Docker image in my, in my Quay registry or Docker hub registry matches this exact commit in my Git repository. Having that one-to-one -one mapping can be really helpful for debugging and just like understanding what's going on. Yeah. And on top of that, avoiding, you know, overriding tags. So yeah. having, you know, in a lot of repos give you the option to set the immutable tag option. Um, ECR, I know for a fact does, um, you know, not that that actually is a security thing as well as a um, just a reliability thing, understanding where exactly the code is that built this artifact, um, but then not being able, not being susceptible to an attack that injects a malicious container into your registry with that tag via that immutable tag option. Um, it's a great, great thing to do for sure. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. It makes it a lot easier to audit too what what happened in your in your registry if something does go wrong, um, knowing that this tag didn't didn't flip around uh, is is really helpful. Right. And what do you all think about uh, scanning your images when you push as well for security vulnerabilities? 
Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, there are, there are some great databases out there of, um, you know, known uh, vulnerabilities inside of, uh, you know, common, common libraries, um, which may or may not be packaged inside of your container and may, may or may not be exploitable. Um, there are some great open source tools for basically taking that, that big database of, uh, um, you know, vulnerabilities and scanning your container for anything inside of that container um, to understand whether those vulnerabilities are present. Um, a lot of registries will build, will build in some kind of container scanning into their registry, um, which is which is great. It's really nice, but uh, doing that scanning as part of your CI/CD process is actually even better because it will you can you can basically break your build um, before that that vulnerable image gets pushed into the registry and can potentially get used. Um, you can you can stop the process and say don't push this image. It has a known vulnerability. Yeah, definitely. To clarify what I said earlier, having immutable tags is a good thing. Uh, I just saw that yeah. pop up in the chat. So immutable tagging, immutable tags in your repository is a good thing, um, as is scanning your containers. And then the last thing I'll add, we'll talk about the last side of the pyramid, the efficiency piece is utilizing Docker's caching uh, in mm -hmm. your build process yeah. can be super helpful, especially when you're doing those multi-stage builds that we talked about. If you cache every stage of that and you push it into your repository, a lot of times, pulling down that big build image is faster than rebuilding it every time. Uh, and so, you know, Docker has that built in in a lot of good ways. Um, and there's lots of different ways to utilize it, but definitely take advantage of caching because that build process can get long if you have a large dependency tree for sure. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think that, um, Container containers do add some extra steps to the build process, and so if you don't do things well, it can really slow down the development loop. Um, so I think you make a really good point there. Another another thing that popped in my head that that kind of sits on the border between good containerization and good container building practices um, from a reliability and efficiency perspective is um, as you're building your your application, copying the dependencies over before. Um, and installing those dependencies before you copy your source code over to the container can really uh, speed up the build because Docker can cache that all those dependencies, which aren't going to change very often, whereas the source code is going to change very frequently. And that way, as you're building your container, that that um, kind of expensive step of, of installing all your dependencies can get cached nicely. Uh, and you don't have to repeat it every time that container builds. That's right. Put your package.json copying before <laughs> you yeah. do your NPM steps. For example. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. Cool. All right. So then the next layer in our pyramid uh, is probably one of the, I would say, like the largest scoped uh, things that we can talk about here today um, because there are so many Kubernetes objects and concepts um, that go into deploying your container that hit all three sides <laughs> of these pyramids. So Let's get into it. Uh, Andy, you want to start? All right. I'm going to I'm going to say the thing that I'm uh, hopefully if I become famous for anything it will be this. Set your resource requests and limits. <laughs> that is the number one thing for both reliability and efficiency that you have to do when you're deploying into Kubernetes. And I know I sound like a broken record. I know Robert <laughs> and Stevie you've heard me say this a thousand times, but we still have, you know, we still see it in the wild, people deploying containers without those resource requests and limits. And that is the, the cornerstone of what makes Kubernetes able to scale well. It makes it able to bin pack well. And um, it also enables you to, you know, run your containers in a way that they're not going to just fall over all the time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. It's, uh, I think, a, a theme around deploying into Kubernetes is that, uh, Kubernetes tries to make your life easy and make it so you can deploy with a very minimal configuration and they'll let you not specify things that you really should be specifying. So memory and CPU nice. requests and limits is a big piece of that. Um, also readiness and uh, liveness probes to make sure that your, your application is actually healthy. Uh, there's a lot of security stuff that isn't exactly secure by default. There's a, there are ways to tighten the security using your configuration. So just relying on the default, the default configuration is, um, uh, a good way to shoot yourself in the foot. You really have to know <laughs> what are the things you should be specifying, even though the Kubernetes API will happily let you not specify them. Definitely. Yeah, yeah that's Definitely. correct. Security context, uh, which you touched on there, is like a big one um, for obviously the security portion of it. Um, you know, making sure that you 
set your uh, appropriate like Linux capabilities, making sure you set it, you know, your run as root and your, uh, allow privilege escalation, all that stuff uh, should be taken care of in your deployment. Um, so that's mm -hmm. super important. Yeah. 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 And then something we talked about earlier comes into this again, um, both from a security and a reliability standpoint, um, using um, specifically tagged images. So not using, you know, something like latest or, you know, just a V1 tag, hopefully you're, you know, we suggested earlier tagging with that Git SHA um, of the commit that built the image, use that in your deployment process as well to know exactly which commit was deployed for this particular version of the application. Um, yeah. And that's a, a really important thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and the other thing I was gonna add, Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, Stevie. No, you go, Robert. <laughs> um, I was going to say, you know, in addition to configuring the deployment itself with resource requests and limits and, and things like that, there are also kind of um, secondary resources you can put alongside your deployment, like a horizontal pod autoscaler, a uh, pod disruption budget, uh, things like that, that can help Kubernetes understand how your application scales up and down, you know, what it should do, um, you know, in the event that... Um, say, uh, you know, you're upgrading the cluster and, and you need to start, you know, pulling out old nodes and sticking in new nodes. Um, these, these extra resources can give Kubernetes hints as to um, basically how to run multiple replicas of your application. Yep, that's, a, that's what I was going to say. Um, and yeah, and in addition to that, like also still within like the actual deployment objects, there are a bunch of things that you can manipulate to sort of, um, you know, help out the reliability of your application, things like, um, you know, whether you want to make sure that your pods aren't all getting scheduled, you know, uh, if they're, they shouldn't get scheduled together, for example, like you don't want a number of Nginx pods scheduled on the same node, um, in case you have to drain that node. Um, things like quality of service settings, you know, um, we, you know, do we do sometimes set like your memory, your request and your limits to be the same to guarantee that like, you know, that process is least likely or, or won't get bumped from a node if it becomes constrained in some way. Like there, there are all kinds of things that you can do at the deployment level as well to mm -hmm. affect uh, the reliability of your, of your um, deployment of your application. Definitely. Definitely. And then to continue to build on the things we talked about earlier, you know, we talked about not building your config and your secrets into your container. This is where you start talking about how you get them in there. So, you know, your non your non secret configuration, you can keep in a config map uh, and, and then pull those in as environment variables into your application or however they need to be consumed, you know, as a config file or uh, environment variables. And then secrets, you know, at the bare minimum, utilizing those Kubernetes secret objects to inject your secrets into your container. And then if you need a higher level of security, looking at something like Vault um, and a, a Vault sidecar to inject those at runtime and pull them directly from your Vault. Um, and there's lots of other solutions out there as well um, to do secrets management, but you know, being extra careful of those. Yeah, that's a great point. I think secrets are, are an easy thing to screw up in the deployment process. Um, one of the patterns that we... Um, like to uh, like to utilize is using SOPs to basically allow you to you know store your secrets in infrastructure as code, which gives you a really good sense for when they change, how they're changing, things like that. But to encrypt them in that infrastructure as code, so they're not you know uh, exposed to anybody who has access to the repository. You need some kind of master key in order to decrypt the secrets and actually see what's in there. Um, that's a really uh, I've I've found that very useful for for tracking those secrets without exposing them. Yeah, definitely. And it allows you to keep, you know, finally control who has access to the secrets and where by using different KMS keys or using a vault transit backend um, to have that fine grain access control over who has access to those secrets. Yeah. All right. So we move on to the next layer. Uh, everyone's favorite monitoring. Um, <laughs> that is to say, not everyone's favorite, actually. Uh, so we've got. <laughs> You know, we've got our stuff running in the cluster. We've done all these great things and, you know, dang, we forgot to instrument <laughs> monitoring for our application. We don't have, uh, you know, any sort of baseline information about uh, how our application is running. And, you know, that's a big deal. So you want to have monitoring um, in the forefront of your, you know, 
whole strategy. Like you want to, uh, because you do get baseline, the baseline information that you can get from monitoring early on in your process is very helpful to uh, understanding if your application is misbehaving in some way and for seeing anomalies and things like that down the line. Uh, you really want that historical data. So uh, Robert, I'm going to tag you next. Let's sure. talk about monitoring. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so like you said, super important. It's, it's really easy to just say, well, you know, my application's working, people are using it, no problem. I can just, you know, let it run. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden something goes wrong, the website goes down and you have no idea why you had no, you know, uh, no heads up that something might be going wrong. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very common pattern, honestly, you don't, you don't fix it until it's really broken. Um, so getting, getting a good monitoring and plan uh, ahead of time is super important. Um, at the very least, you should be sending your your application log somewhere, um, somewhere that's long lived, so that you know you have a record of what's happening, and you can start you know pattern matching on those logs to see if you know there's a sudden spike in in error or warning logs, things like that. Uh, if you're serving HTTP traffic, you know understanding what the status codes are like, making sure 500 errors or something you're alerting on, uh, making sure any kind of unexpected error is getting alerted on, um, all super important. Yep. Definitely. And then from an infrastructure level, monitoring, you know, different pieces of your cluster, right? Uh, understanding the um, that things are behaving the way they should. You don't have a large number of pods pending in your cluster. You're not maxing out your scaling groups. You know, you're using the cluster autoscaler and it's functioning, um, you know, monitoring for simple functionality across it, you know, not going too heavy on, you know, I don't want to know every time a pod restarts, right? Pods restart, that's expected. But if a pod's been restarting, you know, 20 times an hour for the last week, I'd like to know that yeah. um, and things like that. So yeah, Tun tuning that that verbosity in your monitors can be really difficult uh, because you don't want to miss an actual production issue, but you also don't want to like fatigue your team to the point that they start ignoring the alerts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. So so figuring out exactly what the right trade off is there is can be really difficult. Yeah. And should we have called this monitoring and logging? Because uh, I think part of this should be potentially sending like your Kubernetes event logs uh, someplace because those are short lived in the cluster, right? So like if you're trying to track down some really hairy situation, some really hairy behavior, um, you only have a, a very short period of time uh, in the cluster to do like kubectl git events. Whereas if you ship them off somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll uh, dovetail off that to answer a question that just came up in the chat um, about monitoring solutions. You know, we we use Datadog fairly heavily, and one thing that I really like about Datadog is that it lets you uh, overlay in a, a Kubernetes event search over a graph. So if I'm looking at a graph of, you know, uh, latency over time, and or maybe you know. Yeah, latency over time, and I notice there's a spike. I can overlay Kubernetes events and see. Okay, maybe we did a deployment at that time. Maybe you know a bunch of pods became unavailable at that time for some other reasons. You know, maybe that node was drained and my probes aren't working properly. So my application, you know, I was routing traffic to pods that weren't ready to receive traffic or something like that. And the event stream can really be helpful with that. Um, so, and also a good point: observability, monitoring, logging, and you know, if you're feeling really uh uh what's the right word here uh fancy tracing is a, <laughs> tracing. is a can be a useful <laughs> thing for sure yeah. um but i think having that monitoring and logging in place first is, is more important than having tracing um, yeah it can super definitely be helpful no doubt but i would agree it will it could definitely alert you to like security uh issues uh if you see some anomalous behavior um in your logs for sure um yep. But speaking of security, like it, how is it important to make sure that your applications aren't sending uh, secure information in its logs? Like where do you where do you uh, set that? Yeah, that's definitely a um, you know something that that's worth keeping in mind. Like you don't want to be uh, logging users' tokens to uh, to your logs and things like that. You know, it's it's probably not the most. Um, you know that those logs are hopefully only like an internal thing, but you know typically everybody in your engineering organization is going to need access to those logs, and so it makes it really hard to 
um, you know, have a, a sort of principle of least privilege, you know, any kind of like access control type stuff if you're if you're logging those things into those logs. So, um, you know, keeping keeping secure information out of there in a in a place where, um, you know, only the people who need access to it have access to it. I think is important. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think we we could go back to the the beginning of the pyramid here and good containerization practices sure. and talk a little bit about logging. You know, making sure you're logging first, making sure you're logging the standard out, just standard Docker practice, being able to get those logs in an easy manner, but then not logging secrets is you know definitely super important. Uh, and it's an easy thing to do when you're developing and you you know you're struggling with a problem and you want to see what's going on, but you got to remember to to not do that in production for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just real quick, there's a question that I I see in the chat about um, just sort of um, clarifying what the solution was for secrets, uh, putting the secrets in the Git repo. Um, and I think that's going back to like uh, maybe talking about what Robert was saying about using SOPs to yeah. encrypt your secret before you put it in the repo. Um, and then SOPS uses a KMS key uh, with an ARN uh, to encrypt and decrypt that secret. So when it's in your repo, it's encrypted and it only gets decrypted when it gets applied into your cluster. Is that about right, Robert? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it's it's SOPS if you're looking for it. It's a project from Mozilla. Yep, I'll drop it in, I'll drop a link in the chat. Um, but it can use uh, Google KMS, Amazon KMS. It can use a GPG key. It can use Vault Transit backend. Um, there's lots of different ways to work with it. Cool. All right. So now we're at the very top, the pinnacle, if you will, of our pyramid. Optimize. And that's so perfect because it is the pinnacle and optimization feels optimal, which feels top. I'm just riffing on this word here. Forgive me. <laughs> Let's talk about optimization, optimizing uh, your your um, your workload. Now that it's all deployed, you've got all your monitors set up. People are only getting uh, woken up for really important stuff, um, and now we're going to optimize it. Andy, ooh, this is a good one. I mean, the, these top three pieces. I mean, actually, this whole thing should have like one of those little circle arrow diagrams around it, right? Because mm -hmm. you're gonna. You're going to change things in your containerization practice. You're going to build and push. You're going to deploy. You're going to keep watching, and then you're going to optimize. And you're going to come back. But anyway, um, you know things that are relatively easy to watch for over time with with good tooling. Um, you know, making sure that your resource requests and limits are appropriate, that they're not over uh, over provisioned. Right? You know, you may build a container and think it needs six gigs of memory when it needs one, and you can you know turn that down over time. So there's tools out there to help with that. A couple that we have, you know, open source. We have Goldilocks. Um, our Insights platform integrates that as well, and watches also integrates Prometheus metrics. But keeping an eye on you know limits versus how much we're actually using over time. Uh, sorry, requests and limits versus how much we're using over time uh, is an important good first step on optimizing your optimizing for efficiency. So I get yeah. get back to one of our our uh, sides of our pyramid there. Yeah. I mean, just speaking from a developer's perspective, I know in, in the past, I've definitely just, I just want my application to work. I don't really care how efficient it is. So I'll just give it <laughs> way more memory and CPU than it actually needs. And, you know, it runs fine. And then, then I look at those graphs inside of uh, Goldilocks or Insights and I see, oh, wow, I'm using like 10% of what I asked for. Uh, so it's important to keep an eye on that because you do end up with huge cost overruns if you don't, if you don't pay attention to it at all. Um, it's uh it's a very uh a very easy thing to just kind of forget about because everything seems to be working yep um and then the, i think the other piece of the optimization track is something we touched on a little bit in the deployment process is you want to understand you know kind of that that horizontal scale as well in addition to the the memory and cpu amount that you're using vertically you know how many replicas are you running how many do you really need to be running how do you scale up and down when do you scale up and down um you know i think the, the most natural way to scale up and down is if you're using is if uh, if your existing replicas are using too much memory and CPU, you might scale up on that, um, basically on that resource usage. Um, but you may also have other custom metrics like you know the size of a queue for a job that's like processing things off of that queue. If that queue gets really deep, you might want to um, you know increase the number of workers. Um, you might want to scale based on the amount of uh, HTTP traffic you're seeing, things like that. Um, so knowing how to scale up and down uh, intelligently uh, and, and tuning that over time is really important. Yep. 
Definitely. Definitely. You know, another thing from the security perspective is, you know, we talked about scanning for CVEs in your build process, but the next thing you have to do is scan your already running containers in your cluster for those CVEs because they get released all the time. They come up after you've deployed. Maybe it's something you don't release very often and, you know, a new CVE is announced for something that's already running in your cluster. You want to be able to see that and have um, visibility into that. So one of the, you know, the open source tool we talked about earlier for scanning in your CI CD platform will also work in your cluster. Um, uh, and that open source is called Trivi. Um, I think I spelled that right. I'm putting these in the chat, uh, by request. So, um, which we also integrate Trivi into the commercial platform insights that we mentioned in the line above that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, there is a lot of fine tuning you can do, I think on the security side too, there's, um, you know, anybody who's run a, a production server for long enough has seen some like automated attacks just come in and try and see if they're running a vulnerable version of WordPress and things like that. <laughs> um, so figuring out like, you know, basic rules for blocking traffic, um, you know, setting up a WAF or something like that to make sure that, you know, anybody who's obviously just snooping around for a vulnerability ends up getting blocked. Um, things like uh, setting up rate limiting properly to make sure that somebody who's, you know, scraping for, you know, user logins and stuff like that gets blocked pretty quickly. Um, all really important things that, that do need to be fine tuned over time, right? You don't want to block too aggressively and, and, you know, end up blocking out a legitimate user. Um, but you also want to make sure that anybody who's, who's actually trying to attack you gets, gets blocked out pretty quickly. Definitely. You know, and also optimizing your process here um, is something we can talk about because there are ways to, um, you know, integrate checks for security into your deploy process, for example, like by using an admission controller and saying you cannot deploy something that's allowed to run as root into this cluster, um, you know, and, and really optimizing the entire process and then the entire workflow is something that can be really useful. I feel like even though optimize is the smallest part of the pyramid because it's at the top, it's actually the biggest topic because there's so much you can do to make all these different pieces easier and more efficient and more reliable um, over time. So, and more secure, so. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I think we've uh, reached the end of our pyramid. And so now I'm gonna turn this over to Robert uh, to give you all some more information about Fairwinds Insights and how we help you. Uh, ascend that pyramid. <laughs> Thanks, Stevie. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Insights is a, is a commercial platform for um, doing Kubernetes governance and security, um, all the way from, from CICD as your developers and ops teams are making changes to their code base um, through uh, admission control. So kind of stopping things as they uh, are, are trying to enter the cluster. Um, and then scanning that running that running production cluster or staging cluster to make sure that things that are in there are adhering to your policies, best practices, and, and security practices. Um, we we uh, basically the the way uh, Fairwinds Insights operates is we uh, integrate all the best in class open source that's out there. Some of that's our open source projects like uh, Polaris and Goldilocks, uh, which we've touched on. Uh, also projects from from uh, other organizations like Aqua Security's uh, Trivi project for container scanning. Uh, basically, we take all this great open source that uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem has built uh, and we put it behind a single pane of glass so you can uh, do your container scanning and uh, check your policies for best practice or check your uh, Kubernetes configuration for best practices. You can apply uh, policies with uh, uh, OPA or Open Policy Agent. Um, you can take all this great open source and kind of put it all together, uh, run it across multiple clusters in a, in a very consistent way. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really helpful if you've ever tried to kind of deploy this open source in a kind of a one-off basis. Uh, Fairwoods Insights um, really kind of simplifies that process and makes it easy to operationalize that open source. Um, so there's really, really three aspects of, um, of Fairwinds Insights. Uh, one is the security angle. Uh, as well as compliance, um, we can really help you make sure that you know you're not running images with with known vulnerabilities. Uh, make sure that your Kubernetes configuration uh, is adhering to security best practices, like you know disallowing running as root and uh, not having writable file systems, things like that. Um, and we can we can help you really ensure that you're adhering to both any internal compliance standards as well as like any standard compliance standards like like SOC two or HIPAA. ISO, uh, we, we provide a lot of checks that uh, map nicely into those uh, different, um, different security standards. 
then from a, from a cost and optimization perspective, um, we do uh, monitor your memory and CPU usage over time for each workload uh, and, and keep track of that versus the memory requests and limits. Uh, as we were saying earlier, it's really easy to uh, over-provision those things. We also see them under-provisioned sometimes. Um, so making sure that you uh, get those um, uh, requests and limits you know, in, an, in a nice place uh, is super important. Um, and we basically give you a way to uh, mark each workload as, you know, this is a production, you know, mission critical workload, or this one's just a development workload. I don't really care so much about it. Um, you can you can mark those in insights, and we'll give you recommendations for where you should be setting your memory and CPU based on what we've seen that application consume over time. And then the third piece is uh, really around policy and guardrails. Um, uh, this is about, you know, if you if you have any compliance standards that you need to adhere to, if you have any internal standards, like maybe a labeling scheme um, uh, or you know anything that you want to enforce across all your development teams, um, we provide ways to uh, basically create that policy, uh, mainly using uh, OPA's uh, policy language called Rego. Um, and to apply that as guardrails. So you can apply it in the CICD pipeline to make sure that any infrastructure as code adheres to that policy. You can apply it again in admission control to make sure that anything that's coming into your cluster adheres to that policy in case maybe somebody uh, you know, force merged uh, something in Git or if they um, uh, you know, kind of skipped the Git process and did you know a kubectl edit or um, uh, you know just did a kubectl apply on something to get something into your cluster without doing infrastructure as code, which is a big big no no in our uh, our book, but um, it does happen. Uh, and then finally, you can apply that call policy to uh, resources in the cluster, which makes it really easy to to roll out new policies. You can quickly see, um, okay, what what resources are currently in my clusters that would break this policy. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice being able to take the same policy and apply it at all three points in the process. So I have a, a quick demo of, of Fairwinds Insights. Um, I'll share my screen quickly. So this is Fairwinds Insights. Um, you can see on the main page here, I have a list of clusters in my organization. Uh, this Centaurus organization has two clusters, one called Proxima Prod, their production cluster, one called Alpha Staging, their staging cluster. I can see uh, how healthy these clusters are, uh, how many action items are inside these clusters. These are basically things that we've found uh, that, that they could be doing better. Um, we can see uh, their health scores change over time, getting, getting slightly better over time. And we get an overall score for the cluster. Uh, we can see we've got uh, a bunch of passing items, you know, about 1,600 things that, that uh, Insights has checked for that they're doing well. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, a bunch of um, uh, action items here, uh, at range, ranging from, from different uh, levels of um, uh, severity, uh, a few critical items, a few high items, a good chunk of, of medium level items in here too. Um, so we can click into one of these clusters and see um, how things have changed over time. It looks like this is a pretty quiet cluster, um, but a critical action item was introduced a couple weeks ago. Uh, we can see the health score has been pretty stable. And then we can see kind of a list of the, the top issues that are in this cluster. Uh, it looks like the most common issue is uh, uh, vulnerable images. Again, this is, this is something that Trivi is checking for. It's scanning those clusters for known CVEs. Um, there's a bunch of other things that Insights checks for, uh, like best practices, like you know, not having uh, your your pull policy set to always, um, not allowing privilege escalation, uh, not giving your containers insecure capabilities, um, running as high user IDs, things like that. Um, so we can click into these to see you know exactly what's going on here. Uh, we can see you know we've got uh, some some vulnerable images. Uh, we can click into each one of these and see you know what exactly is going wrong inside of this image. Um, I can click out of this and, and get a, a broader view here. Um, we've got projects like KubeBench, which show um, uh, basically like uh, how you adhere to the Sys benchmark, which is a common benchmark. You can see there's some, some action items from that. Um, really, there's a whole bunch of different uh, things that Insights can check depending on which of our reports you decide to install. Um, this is really where uh, you can configure exactly what it is you care about, what it is you want to check. Um, we try to integrate all the best in class open source software out there for, um, for scanning Kubernetes clusters for issues. Um, you can see some of these are our projects like Polaris and Goldilocks. Some of them are third party projects like Trivi and Open Policy Agent. 
Um, and each of these kind of does one thing well. Um, Polaris is all about uh, deployment configuration and best practices there. Truby is all about scanning container images. Goldilocks is about um, setting uh, memory requests and limits, CPU requests and limits uh, properly. Uh, OPA is about policy enforcement. Nova, make sure your Helm charts are up to date. Pluto's for deprecated resources. Um, each of these really uh, focuses on one task and you can kind of pick and choose which ones work for you. Um, we talked a bunch about um, uh, doing uh, uh, CPU and memory uh, resources properly. Um, we have this workloads tab to really show you, you know, what your costs are over time. This is a pretty, pretty stable cluster. So you pre see a pretty straight line here for um, uh, memory and CPU. Um, but you can click into each one and understand, okay, um, you know, what are my, what are my requests and limits set at? Uh, what should they be set at? Uh, you can see uh, for this workload, um, we're actually recommending that they tune down their memory a little bit um, from 512 megabytes uh, to 322. Uh, they can save a little bit of money doing that. Um, you can see also for CPU, you know, we, we're actually tracking the usage over time. So you can actually see, okay, you know, how much am I actually using? We can see this this workload. The reason we're recommending 322 megabytes is that generally speaking, it's it's well under 300 or so. Uh, usually, it seems to be sticking around 330. Um, so we're recommending you know a re re uh, request of 322 and then a limit of 360. Um, so that's that's you know our way of kind of helping folks really right size these resources and figure out okay what what um, what should I be setting as my CPU and memory of requests and limits. Um, I think that's about it. There's there's a lot more I can go into, but it's it's a very big platform at this point. Um, we do things like policy enforcement. Um, uh, you, you can get a view into uh, role-based access control and how well you're doing there. Uh, you can see a list of add-ons um, like Helm charts that, that uh, may or may not be up to date. Um, you can view a list of uh, admission controller events, see uh, when things were rejected, um, when things were allowed into the cluster, um, and see a list of things that could be, could be going better there. Um, that's taking a second to load. Um, it's uh, an easy way to get a sense for, you know, uh, what, what's being allowed into your cluster, what might be uh, um, getting rejected. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'll go back to the slides. I think we have one, one more polling question for y'all. Yes. Uh, so the second polling question, what is your greatest opportunity to improve your Kubernetes environment? Uh, A, getting help with the basics. B, general best practices uh, assessment. C, improving the security posture of your clusters. D, saving money. And E, improving the re reliability of apps running in Kubernetes. So seeing responses coming in, that's great. Nobody no wants to save money. <laughs> so far, it doesn't look like it. No, it's like Robert said, you, st you start off just like throwing uh, <laughs> everything on the largest instances you have just to get it going. It's not until your CFO yells at you that you start thinking, oh, okay, maybe I should uh, take a look. Right. You, you mean I don't start with M5 24XLs? Why not? <laughs> Come on. Every app gets four gigs baseline. <laughs> All right. And so far, 40% uh, have said getting help with the basics, 30% uh, general best practices assessment. 10% uh, improving your improving the security posture of your clusters. Uh, still nobody on saving money, 0% there. <laughs> and 19% uh, uh, improving the re reliability of apps running in Kubernetes. Hmm. I'm surprised to see that uh, getting help with the basics is the highest considering the results from the first poll where it was evenly split between everybody, almost evenly split between the, the phase of the journey. Yeah, uh, I, think I think running in prod actually came out highest at the end of that first poll. Did it? So, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty interesting. 
the basics are hard. You got to get the fundamentals right. That's yeah. true. Oh, no, I didn't. Cool. Well, so we have here a, uh, a white paper um, on Kubernetes best practices. So for those of you who did want help with the basics, I think this is a great um, uh, a great uh, piece, piece of reading material for you to understand, okay, what, what are best practices? How do I, um, you know, best uh, implement those best practices, make sure they're followed going forward by each of my development teams. Um, this is a great, a great uh, kind of overview of those best practices. Uh, and we'll leave this up, I think, while we do some Q&A. Absolutely, yes. Um, we do have a couple of questions. And uh, just as a reminder, if you do have a question for our panel here, uh, you can do so by submitting them in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, and this was a question from a little bit earlier. It says, I didn't understand, is the immutable tag a good thing or a bad thing? Definitely a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's Excellent. an easy one. Excellent. Keep them coming if they're that easy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, we also had. Uh, can you compare your solution to Aquasec and uh, and to Alert Logic? Uh, yeah. So I would say the the main differentiator with Aqua is that you know we're we're a very open source first uh, platform. Um, you know, we basically rather than um, building a bunch of proprietary. Uh, logic, we we recognize that the Kubernetes ecosystem has really done a, a tremendous job of building open source tools um, that that do the work of of uh, detecting security events, detecting efficiency and reliability issues. Um, they're just really hard to operationalize in practice, um, which is why people opt for a commercial platform. There, there's a there's a cost to using open source that is. Um, uh, really hard to quantify, but once you actually start trying to use it for a, for a production use case, it becomes really obvious that you're spending a lot of time uh, maintaining your integration with that open source, um, you know, making sure that any new use cases get supported, et cetera. So it really does make sense to kind of bring in a commercial partner to help operationalize that open source. Uh, so I think that's our big our big differentiator. I don't know a lot about Alert Logic, but my impression is that they're uh, really more of like a white glove um, security uh, uh, vendor. That they're they're much more kind of services driven um, and much more security focused. I, both both of those companies are much more uh, just plain old security focused, whereas we really try to be a holistic. Uh, window into, you know, how healthy is your Kubernetes environment? Um, you know, not just from a security perspective, but also from an efficiency and a reliability perspective. You know, are your applications going to crash? Um, you know, are they going to scale properly? Um, you know, are you spending too much money? Are you are you not allocating enough resources to those workloads? Um, those are all questions you can answer with Fairwinds Insights. Excellent. Uh, next question here. Uh, is there any chance to share the price for uh, Fairwinds Insight? Is it per cluster? Uh, I believe we generally charge per node. I think you'd have to get in touch with our sales team for for actual pricing, though. Um, it tends to be it tends to differ differ from from organization to organization depending on your use case, et cetera. All right. Uh, still have time for a couple of questions here. Uh, what is the what's the most common security mistake you see most clients make? It's a good it's a good question. There's there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like uh, not setting a security context um, on their pods or at the container level is probably one of the most basic ones. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. Ha having some kind of policy in place that kind of uh, forces people to do that because it is an optional thing. You can totally, you know, Kubernetes will happily accept uh, a deployment without a security context. Um, so having some kind of, uh, you know, policy and guardrails in place to make sure people are setting that, uh, especially if you've got like a multi-tenant type environment where you have multiple different development teams all shipping into the same cluster. Um, it's, uh, it can be hard to do code review on every, every single change they make. Excellent. Uh, next question. What should you look for first when you try to cost optimize your clusters? Do I get to be the broken record again and say resource requests and limits? <laughs> Do it. That's going to be Do my it. thing. I'm going to be the yeah. Kubernetes resource and requests, limits and requests guy. Yeah. So yeah, definitely like checking to make sure that you're actually using um, what, what you think you need. Yeah. So. Yeah. And once you do have those set, uh, my, my big thing is just looking at, 
for each of your nodes, are you using all your memory or all your CPU? Like where are you more constrained, memory or CPU? If you're if you're using up every ounce of memory you have and have a bunch of leftover CPU, you might want to change your node type in order to, you know, get memory optimized nodes or vice versa if you're using a lot of CPU. Um, you know, figuring out uh, what the what the right node type for you to run on is, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then the next next easiest thing is you know utilizing spot or preemptible instances uh mm -hmm. you know specifically in your non-prod environments first but you know if you have all of your reliability pieces buttoned down it is perfectly viable a perfectly viable option in your production environment as well for a lot of use cases okay and the last question i see here how many clusters could you have to benefit from insights Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Andy's right. Uh, even even just a single cluster, it's helpful. Um, I think the the big place where you start getting huge benefits from insights is if you're if you, if you're a really small company with you know one one engineering team that's doing all the ops and development. It's probably pretty easy for you to keep an eye on things, you know, in that one cluster, one team, et cetera. Um, the second you have multiple teams deploying into Kubernetes, uh, or you have a, a dedicated ops team separate from the development team, things start to get, you, you start to really need, uh, you know, better visibility into what's happening, uh, a better platform for communication between those different teams, uh, especially if you have def many different development teams, um, things things get out of sync very quickly and uh, you really need eyes on that. So the second you reach any sort of scale, um, it's good to uh, it's good to, to get a commercial platform in there to help you, you know, understand what's in there. Um, but even even in those early days, it's good to kind of establish those practices at the beginning to understand um, so to know that you'll be able to grow into into a, um, positive practices rather than trying to uh, layer them on after after the fact. Yeah. I really like that distinction of the multiple teams. Uh, I think, you know, we draw the line at clusters too often. Um, it's really, you know, I have I have talked to a company that has one cluster for dev stage and prod, uh, but they have 30 different teams deploying into it. And so, you know, that's a very different scenario where insights can be super helpful in a single cluster uh, versus multi-clusters, you know, and most organizations will have, you know, a prod and a non-prod cluster at, you know, minimum. Most. So. Excellent. All right. We are nearing the top of the hour. So quickly, I just want to say that uh, today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the webinar, you will be able to watch it again. We will be sending out an email with a link to access the webinar on demand. Uh, you can also find it on DevOps.com or uh, ContainerJournal.com. Just look in the on demand section in the webinars page and it should be there. Uh, we also did have the four winners for the $25 Amazon gift card. Our first winner is Eduardo C. So congratulations, Eduardo. Our second winner is Christopher M. So congratulations. Our third winner is uh, Citaram S. And finally, Yaroslav S. So uh, congratulations to all our winners. We'll be reaching out to you with, uh, with an email with instructions for claiming your Amazon gift card. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see it there, check your folder. Uh, Robert, Andy, and Stevie, thank you so much for taking the time to put this presentation together and uh, demo. We really all we all appreciate it. Thanks, Julio. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Of course. And finally, thank you to the audience for their time and engagement. Uh, this is Julio Godinez signing off. Until next time, be well. <laughs>